everyone, welcome back to another video. If you don't know me, my name is Rachel and I make videos about books and science and history and all kinds of fun social commentary and just whatever interests me at the time. Today we're going to be talking about what I think is one of the most daunting pieces of literature out there. Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. It is long, it's poetry, and it's all written in Middle English. It is very, very easy to see why people are so scared of it. It basically looks and sounds nothing like English as we know it today, but it is probably one of the big formative pieces of literature. It's a huge part of like how our language has developed, how our approach to literature has developed. It has inspired so many other pieces of work and other poets and their writing, and it's just kind of amazing and it's worth talking about despite how scary it looks. Chaucer began writing the Canterbury Tales in 1387 and continued till his death in 1400. The Canterbury Tales is a series of interconnected short stories in which Chaucer inserts himself as a character and a narrator who meets this really varied group of people in a pub each making their own pilgrimage to Canterbury Cathedral. So they all begin to travel together and as they travel they tell each other stories. And some of the stories clearly feature characters used to poke fun at or critique other members of the group. So you'll have like, you know, one of them tells a story about a partner and there's a partner in the group. One of them tells a story about a merchant and there's a merchant in the group. One of them makes a critique of nuns or priests and there's nuns and priests in the group, that kind of thing. It's thought that sadly the Canterbury Tales remains incomplete. There was some characters that are mentioned in the prologue who don't actually get their own stories and their own little time to shine in, you know, the work as a whole and it's thought that because Chaucer had died while he was writing it, they were never really finished, they were left out. And so I guess we'll never know what they were supposed to be, sadly. That said, it's already over 17,000 lines long. This is an absolute beast of a piece of work. Let's be honest, it doesn't really need to be any longer, does it? It's, it's already a lot. <laughs> but as I've said, despite how big and scary this looks, there is a lot anyone can get out of this piece of writing if you read the right version for you. And there are a lot of different translations and versions out there and it can be a little bit overwhelming knowing where to start and what works for you. A lot of people tend to be kind of snobbish and be like, well, if you don't read the original, then what's the point? But I could not disagree more with that. But on the other hand, there'll also be people who look at it and say like, ah, oh, nah, it's a bit, bit too difficult and boring for me, isn't it? But again, I thoroughly disagree. I think if you pick the right version, you'll likely find it interesting. Because, you know, there's even silly things like people who might look at the Canterbury Tales and think it's boring will go and love a film like A Knight's Tale, you know, the amazing Heath Ledger one with the jousting and the knights and the, oh my God, that was the first film I ever got on DVD and I love it so much. And in preparing for this video, I went and rewatched it and oh my God, it still holds up. It's fantastic, it's wonderful. So many references to the Canterbury Tale in that. The title of the film is a reference to the Canterbury Tales. You have certain characters in the films that are references to characters in the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer is a character in the film. Chaucer, do I need to say more? He has this amazing part where um, you have the summoner and the pardoner who are like after him for his debts. And Chaucer says like, you know, I will immortalize you in literature. I'll make sure like every single like wart and this and this of yours is known and you know, memorialized and kind of like critiqued forever. And that's a reference to the Canterbury Tales. So while I wouldn't say A Knight's Tale is a version of the Canterbury Tales, it is something that heavily references it and I think it's proof that everyone can get some kind of enjoyment out of this book even if it's just like understanding a few of the references in a comedy film, you know? But Silly film aside and talking about the actual like book and literature and stuff. Today in this video I'm going to offer you a brief non-exhaustive list of a couple of different versions and translations of the Canterbury Tales. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each one, what approach each one takes and who might be best suited to reading each one so that you can think about your own needs and think you know what this is where I'm going to start if you want to. But before we jump into the meat of the video, let me offer some shameless self-promotion because I always forget to do this stuff. Recently, I've been making lots of extra fun content over on TikTok and Instagram. You can go see some of my reels over there. Um, you can see all sorts of stuff from photos of the miniatures that I paint to fashion and kind of like outfit reels and stuff if you like my style and my clothing and that kind of thing. I'm also making like miniature book reviews and stuff talking about like books that have kind of influenced my life and changed my life and a sort of mini bookcase tour if you will because I have a lot of books. I have a bookcase in every room. My house is filled with books and reading and 
joy and I just kind of wanted to share part of that with you. So if you want some extra content, you can go follow me over on Instagram at Rachel Oates with a zero instead of an O because my name was taken and just Rachel Oates, I think, over on TikTok. So you can go see them there if you want. And as always, if you're new here, it'll be great if you want to subscribe because I make videos all the time, whenever I can, really. And if you like this video, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment and share it around on the internet because it really, really helps me. Yeah, okay, that's it. I think we're done. We're going to start briefly with five quick reasons why you might be interested in reading the Canterbury Tales in the first place. Number one is that it is a great insight into English society at the time, in the late 1300s, early 1400s, when the gap between peasants and nobility was only just starting to be bridged and we were on the cusp of all these big changes in society. That said, many of the characters, while maybe their jobs and roles and lifestyles might not be familiar to us today, who they are as people, their actions, their motivations, their personalities are incredibly familiar. It just shows that humanity hasn't really changed that much deep down in the last six or 700 years. We're still all humans at the end of the day and it's still very, very relatable. And number two is, even though it might seem daunting, you know, 17,000 lines, all poetry, it's not one big poem poem or novel like some people think. The Canterbury Tales is actually a collection of short stories with short sections in interspersed between them which connect them and you know tell you who's telling the story and why as the group can continue on their journey. Because of this you can read the stories in whatever order you want and group them together in whatever way you want. For example if you only want to read stories with a certain theme you can do that absolutely fine. And different groups of stories will present opposing ideas on a number of topics. For example, there's a whole range of stories which debate whether marriage is even a good thing and what makes a good marriage and how to have a happy marriage if that's even possible. Number three is that Chaucer is funny as hell and I don't think a lot of people realise this because they see Middle English and think, oh, dull and dry and drab. Not true at all. There's something for everyone in this book. It's not just a long poem. There are raunchy sex scenes, there are deep philosophical debates, there's a hell of a lot of humour, both crude and clever. Chaucer's character is incredibly dry at times and often scathing in his, I guess, appraisals of the other characters, or not even appraisals, just his judgments of the other characters. He uses humour to poke fun at certain characters and their flaws, including himself and his own. There's a fair amount of satire in there that gives us a really interesting insight into English society at the time. But overall, it's all lighthearted and quite fun. It's not just cruel for the sake of it, it's humorous. And there's a lot of stuff in there where some of the jokes and references might go over your head if you don't have like footnotes or a certain translation or something like that. But on the whole, there are things in here that I think everyone's going to find funny at some point. Number four is that it is a wonderful example of unreliable narrators and how important it is to consider who is telling a story when you're reading pieces of literature. Because Chaucer's self-insert narrator introduces us to each of the characters in the prologue, we get to see them through his eyes and his completely biased and often unreliable viewpoint. However, once they begin their journey and begin to tell their own stories, we see different sides of them as we learn about who they are, what they think of each other, what they value in the stories they tell and how they interact with each other on this journey. There's no just one objective, well, this character is like this. It's well, this character sees himself like this, but this character sees them like this, and this character sees them like this, and the narrator sees them like this and this, so who actually are they? It's really interesting. Number five is that it is an absolutely key piece of literary history and that it helped popularise literature being written in English. At the time, most was written in Latin or French or Italian, but Chaucer, along with a few other key writers at the end of the 1300s, really helped people see value in literature and more specifically poetry written in Middle English. Before then, people didn't think it sounded nice, they didn't think it was good, they didn't think you could really make art in English, and Chaucer proved them wrong. And for that reason, it is really, really enlightening to read something which is such a big and influential part of our history and literary history. So with that in mind, if you've decided to read The Canterbury Tales, where do you start? Which version do you read? So for number one, let's start with the simplest. If you are overwhelmed by Middle English and poetry and the length of the text in general, then I thoroughly recommend the retelling by Sarah Courtauld, Dr. Abiel Wheatley and Susanna Davidson. It is easily one of the most readable versions and it focuses primarily on the narrative, which means it's great for readers of all abilities. You absolutely do not need to understand or even be able to recognize any Middle English to be able to get something out of this one. And it's all written in prose, which means no poetry, just very, very straightforward standard English as we 
we know it today. Its main focus is just telling the story in an interesting and accessible way. The downside to this version is that it is the least faithful to the original text and you do lose a lot in the process of that which is a bit of a shame. It swaps some of the plot points around, it introduces characters in a different order and it misses out a considerable number of the characters and their stories namely the cook's tale, the summoner's tale, the clerk's tale, the physician's tale, the shipman's tale, the prioress's tale, the tale of Melody, the monk's tale, the second nun's tale, and the parson's tale. So that's a big chunk of the text that they just didn't include in this version. To look at the prologue alone, it's an extremely watered down version. You don't get the same insights into the characters. You don't get Chaucer's cheeky remarks, like where he calls the shipman a good fellow, before going on to tell us he's actually a bit more of like a um, very efficient pirate who makes his enemies walk the plank often. <laughs> Another example would be in the description of the knight. Um, instead of being the first character introduced in the prologue, he, he sort of stuffed in the middle in this version and rushed through. And instead of actually being told about like all these achievements in battle and have his battles recited to us and his strength shown and blah, 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 we're simply told. He'd taken part in 15 famous battles and was three times picked to fight a mortal combat. He'd always killed his man. But for all his fame, he was wise, modest, and mild-mannered as a maid. Compare that to um, this little section here from the Neville Coghill translation, which we're going to be looking at in a minute. And you see, this is a lot more wordy, it's a lot more intimidating to read, but it's also, this is more showing than telling. Whereas the simple version, Sarah Courtauld version, just kind of tells you these things. So this version, this prose version, it's far more straightforward, but also maybe takes a little bit of the fun out of reading. So with those pros and cons in mind, why would you choose this version? Who would choose this version? Well, first up, it's great for younger readers, it's great for less confident readers, and it's great for readers if English isn't your first language, and you're just looking for a bit of an introduction to the literature and the history of English literature, and you want to improve your English skills in general. Middle English is hard to understand, and it's completely understandable if you want to avoid that. The modern poetry translations are easier than the, the original text, but they're still hard as well, because they're poetry. And there's absolutely no shame in choosing to read a simpler version or just a simpler version first so you know exactly what's going on. Maybe you need someone to just say, hey, this is the plot and this happens and this happens and there are these characters. And then maybe once you've read this version, if you want to, you can go on to read one of the more slightly more complex versions so you have an idea what's going on going in and it's not quite so daunting and it's not quite so overwhelming. By reading a simple version like this first and then comparing it to a more difficult one, you can build up your skills in a way that isn't overwhelming, that doesn't take too long, that doesn't just burn you out completely, you know? Like if you're learning a language and you want to read some like texts in another language, like you don't just jump straight into reading, I don't know, like complex medical journals in French, do you? No, you start with simple stuff. You learn like, this is a dog, this is a cat. And then you start reading stuff that's like, you know, the dog is beautiful and gorgeous and has a wonderful little personality. And Kyra sat down here, by the way. Um, and then you might go on to reading things about like, you know, dogs behave this way and this way and this way. And then you build up and build up. And then one day you have enough ability to probably read a complex medical journal in French about dogs if you really, really want. You take it in steps, you take it slowly, you build up your skills. And there's absolutely no shame in that at all. Middle English is essentially like another language and it's absolutely okay to take it in steps to building up to understanding it and reading it if that's what you want to do. Alternatively, you don't even just need to use this as a stepping stone. Maybe this is all you want to read and that's absolutely okay too. You might just want to read this, enjoy the story, and you shouldn't feel any shame in that at all. Reading is all about pleasure and getting something out of what you're reading in your own way. And if a text like this is what feels right to you and is what is gonna make you enjoy it the most, then you absolutely read that, you go for it. I don't think there's any reason for certain people to be kind of snobby about it, you know? No, thank you, you're gonna snort into the microphone for me. Which version do you recommend, hmm? I see. She likes the version that I read to her when it's thundering. Don't you, baby? Yes. Yeah. It's actually very cute. She's, well, it's not cute that she's scared of thunder and fireworks and stuff like that. But I found the only way to calm her down during those nights is um, I put on some classical music. Chopin's your favorite, isn't it? You love his nocturnes. You do. Um, so we put on some really relaxing classical music like Chopin's nocturnes and I pick out a book and I just read to her and I rub her back while I read. And there's just something about like the mix of all that together 
and the music kind of drowning out the thunder or the fireworks and then my voice talking to her and soothing her and it keeps you nice and calm, doesn't it, baby? Yeah, it does. It does. And we don't like those nasty fireworks, do we? No, we don't. But you're so brave, aren't you? You're so brave. I love you. And number two, the next version I'm going to recommend is another prose version, and this is the translation by Peter Aykroyd. Being prose, again, it's probably a little easier and more accessible for less confident readers and people who just aren't fans of poetry in general, which is absolutely fine. Some people aren't. Again, no shame in that. Um, but this version is more faithful to the original text than the aforementioned version. This version is really nice though because it still contains lots of the lovely detail of the original version by Chaucer and it still has lots of poetic language and descriptions. Like again to mention the pro prologue because it's probably like the easiest bit to compare between the versions. When Chaucer is setting the scene for the pilgrimage it contains these really lovely lines like, and this is from the Peter Ackroyd version, when the soft sweet showers of April reach the roots of all things, refreshing the parched earth, nourishing every sapling and every seedling, then humankind rises up in joy and expectation. And a little bit further on, the sun had passed midway through the sign of the ram, a good time for the sinews and the heart. Like it's just, it's beautiful. So it's not just stripped back and straightforward and kind of dull and this happened, this happened, this happened. It still has lots of this really beautiful, lovely imagery. It still has lots of references to religion and mythology and the culture at the time. And it's absolutely lovely. It's, it's a really, really nice piece of prose to read that is very heavily influenced by the original text. It's an almost complete version of the text, but it is still missing a couple of little bits. For example, it's missing the tale of Melaby, but that's kind of understandable because this one's a, it's an odd part of the book because it's sort of said to be a bit of a joke told by Chaucer's character in response to his last tale in the narrative being criticised and called boring by another character. So when that happens, Chaucer's character responds with the tale of Melaby, which is long and dry and dull and really boring. And he's like clearly trying to be more and more boring and just like drag it out to annoy the other characters. So. In this version uh, by Peter Ackroyd, the criticisms of his last story by the other characters are kept in, but just not the story told in response, which may be a good thing as it's often said to be one of the more tedious parts of the Canterbury Tales and which many people say they skip anyway, but it's meant to be tedious. So again, it's like, it's the weird humor that Chaucer had. He's like, oh, you're gonna say that I'm boring? I'm gonna show you boring. But maybe he takes it too far by being too boring. It's, it's funny. Uh, but the point is, that's missed out of this version. So take that as you will. Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> so why might you choose to read this version? Well, if you're not a fan of poetry or you just find it a little overwhelming, then this is the version for you. It's still simple to read and understand and the writing style is going to be more familiar to you, but it's still got lots of the references that, the, that were in the original text. It's still got the poetic flair of the original text, which I personally love. And I know that I'm personally a huge fan of poetry, but I also completely understand that it's not for everyone and that's absolutely okay. Some people just want to read a book and get stuck into a good story or novel via prose and if that sounds like you then this is the version that I recommend. And number three we have Neville Coghill's modern poetic translation of the Canterbury Tales which is a favourite for many many readers. Some people say this is the best modern translation but others disagree. It's there are a couple out there. This is this is the one I liked best out of just the excerpts I've read of a few of them. So this is the one that I chose to include on the list and read myself and stuff. Basically, it contains the complete text with no stories missed out. Although interestingly, the order in this has been changed. So they're arranged into groups rather than the fragments that are more common. The groups were favored more by like Victorian audiences and it's just the order that the stories are put in in the book. It's ne neither's necessarily better than the other, just different scholars think they're better suited in different orders thanks to recurring themes between them. And there's no consensus about what order they were supposed to be in. 
like I say, like because the pilgrimage itself is merely like a backdrop to the story here, and Chaucer never really focused on the narrative of they travelled here, then here, then here. Like you really can read these in whatever order you want. So whether these are arranged into fragments or groups or thrown in willy nilly, it doesn't really matter. You're still gonna have the same experience mostly. You really can read them however you like. <laughs> and what's really nice about this translation is that it's still incredibly faithful to the original text while still being very readable and accessible for modern modern audiences. Uh, Coghill keeps all of Chaucer's poetic language and descriptions and he sticks to the rhyme schemes where possible and he doesn't significantly alter any large chunks of the text except I think to give a more abridged version of the tale of Melaby for the reasons we spoke about in the last section. That said he does make some like syn syntax? syntaxial? Syn he, yeah, he makes some changes to the syntax in order to keep the rhyme scheme in place. So for one example here I'm going to compare you um, a section again from the prologue just because it's easy to work with on video and I'm going to read you out the modern translated version but I'm going to put the original Chaucer version on screen as well so you can see the differences. There was also a nun, a prioress, her way of smiling very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only by Saint Loy, and she was known as Madame Eglantine, and when she sang a service with a fine intoning through her nose, as was most seemly, she spoke daintily in French extremely. Out of the school of Stratford at a bow, French in the Paris style she did not know. At meat her manners were well taught withal, no morsel from her lips did she let fall, and, and so on and so on. Notice the slight syntax change on lines as, uh, on lines as? Where did that come from? <laughs> on, on lines 1, 2, 3 and 1, 2, 4 to maintain the rhyme scheme here and compare that to the original. So I'm going to attempt some terrible Middle English pronunciations now. I'm probably going to be awful here. Please don't judge me too harshly. I struggle enough pronouncing like standard English words today. Like, like ugh, I, I've t spoken about this before. I had issues with my teeth when I was growing up and I didn't have front teeth for a really, really long time. So when they finally, like my adult teeth grew in, it was like I had to learn to speak all over again at the age of nine. Like my tongue just didn't feel like it fit in my mouth anymore. and. I've really struggled with pronouncing words my entire life. It's, it's a difficult one for me. <sighs> Trying to speak Middle English on top of that, it's, just, it's never going to work out well for me, is it? But we're going to give it a go. So while in Middle English, Semily and Fettersley might rhyme, when you translate them to Modern English, they become seemly and daintily which don't rhyme at all. So it wouldn't make sense to keep them in there in that order and still be able to maintain the rhyme scheme. So Neville Coghill, clever man that he is, switches things around, changes the syntax, the word order, and he changes it so the line ends on extremely, which does rhyme with the modern English pronunciation of seemly, which maintains the rhyme of these lines and the overall flow of the poem. Being able to do this for the entire 17,000 lines takes, oh my god, time, practice, effort, a thorough understanding of the text and both languages. It's genius, absolutely genius. Like We cannot overstate how much skill goes into a good translation, seriously, it's oh, quality. So with all this in mind, why might you choose to read this version of the Canterbury Tales? I would say if you want as authentic an experience of reading Chaucer as possible without having to flick through a ton of footnotes or just notes in general or a whole of a second book sometimes, then this might be the version that you want to choose. You don't need to know Middle English to get something out of this version and the average reader who isn't a scholar studying the text will still probably get as much out of this version as they would the original text but they'll get there a lot quicker and with less effort so you're less likely to feel frustrated or bored or overwhelmed and as I always say it's really really important to enjoy what you read and read what you enjoy. So if you want an authentic Chaucer experience with a modern twist this is the version I'd recommend. And at number four my final recommendation recommendation is the Penguin's Classic version edited by Jill Mann. Edited being the operative word here because this isn't a translation, it's simply an edited version. This is the most legit original Middle English, almost exactly as Chaucer wrote it and intended, version of the Canterbury Tales that I'm familiar with. Jill didn't come along and change any of the words, she didn't translate any of it, but she did add in a hell of a lot of helpful notes. This version of course, while incredibly not even just faithful to the original, it's basically the original. It's very, very difficult to read if you're not familiar with Middle English. The spellings are different, the pronunciations are different, the 
words in general are different. There are different like idioms and stuff, and stuff that they used at the times that we might not be familiar with today. But like I say, what I like about this version is that it comes with tons and tons and tons of footnotes thanks to Jill and her editing. They provide us with translations of certain words, help with pronunciations. There's a fantastic introduction in this version about Chaucer's use of language and Middle English in general, and it contains lots of sources and further reading and history of the text. There's like, like the reference list and further reading list in this book is phenomenal. It's very, very good. But that said, if you're not familiar with Middle English to the average reader, this is going to take some work to get through and it's going to take a lot of time and effort, but you might think that's worth it. So why might you choose this version? This is the version to read if you want to experience Chaucer as he intended and still understand everything in it. If you're a student studying Chaucer at a high level, I'd suggest this version. If you're already familiar with Middle English or just want a really authentic experience, this is the version I'd recommend. But be warned, it will probably take some time and effort to get through sometimes the best books do. Um, and that is it for my list of recommendations today and who should read what. Of course, this is by no means an exhaustive list, as I said in the beginning. It would be impossible and stupidly expensive and stupidly time consuming for me to be able to read or even be familiar with every single translation and version of the Canterbury Tales out there. It just, I'm one person, it's not possible. So, of course there will be other options too, maybe there's a version you've read and prefer, maybe there's a version you've read and hated, either way let me know down in the comments, but I think for those unfamiliar with Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales I think this is a good starting point for various readers, depending on what you're looking for, what your abilities are and where your interests lie and what you're looking to get out of it. So please let me know down in the comments if you enjoyed this video, if you think you might go ahead and try and read the Canterbury Tales now and if so which version you want to give a go. Ah, oh, but for now thank you for watching today. Uh, if this has actually been a really difficult video to film, Kyra, bless her, has been so demanding during this one because we've got our first little bit of sun in weeks and she's wanted to go out on the balcony but it's still chilly so she wants to come back in, she wants to cuddle, she wants to play. We finally went out to play this morning for the first time in days because we've had really bad storms here and it's been raining, it's been snowing, it's been windy, we've had things blown all over the place, like the wind was like dangerously bad. Um, just a few minutes up the road here there's like really bad wind tunnels on some of the main roads so they literally closed the road off during bad storms and stuff so we had to avoid that so walks were shorter, she didn't like being outside, she didn't like playing in the garden because it was all muddy and wet and she was grumpy so we finally went out for a big long play this morning and she loved it but now she's like I want to do it again, I've got like days worth of playing to catch up with so She's a little bit of a demanding one, but she's worth it. Um, hopefully I can edit around her little uh, interludes, but we'll see. <laughs> if not, <laughs> sorry about that. It's just, um, it's one of those things, you know, but this is her home, this is her life. She comes first for me. She's, she's my little gorgeous girl. And yeah, even when I'm working, she has to be my priority. Um, so thank you for your patience and putting up with that. Thank you for watching today. I can't wait to hear your thoughts down in the comments and hopefully I'll see you again soon. One thing I will say is that if you are one of these people who's like, oh, only read the real version, oh, no, 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 no. Like, if you're gonna be snobby, don't. You know, it doesn't make you better than anyone if you read the Middle English version and someone read um, the simple, uh, like, prose version. No, you both got enjoyment out of a book. You both learned something. You both, you know, probably challenged yourself in different ways and that's something to be celebrated. Don't look down on anyone because they're reading a different version to you and don't think anyone's better than you because they've read a more complex version than you. No, it's all about doing what's right for you and enjoying yourself and that's what I want people to make sure they remember down in the comments and just treat each other with a little bit of respect and kindness, yeah? Okay, I'm done. Thank you, bye! <laughs>